Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Lecture number two by Christina Brenna, topological physics. Okay, good. So last time uh, I told you about topological systems and um, uh, different systems which are forming edge states, like graphene, that was not topological, and also some uh, systems which are topological. And I promise you that today I'm going to uh, give you the techniques that we use in condensed matter to calculate these edge states, you know, to study these edge states. So it's going to be a pretty basic course based on the various techniques that we use to to calculate uh, the formation of edge states in various in various systems. They are quite general. I mean, for students, uh, should be quite uh, quite useful because we present kind of uh <coughs> the things that we do to actually get these edge states. <laughs> okay. So the first thing <laughs> I'm going to start with, some of you may be uh, familiar with, is uh, the tide mining model, uh, and I'm talking about the numerical implementation of tide mining model and how, uh, based on the Hamiltonian, we can obtain uh, we can obtain the edge states. It's going to be pretty basic, and again, feel free to interrupt and ask questions if you don't understand something. Okay. So um, I told you that the tight binding Hamiltonian. sum over uh, the two nearest neighbors oh. so I have hopping terms between two nearest neighbors and I can have also uh, coupling between next two nearest neighb neighbors or higher order um, or higher order uh, terms so let me write just one uh, the most basic one I'm taking for example a chain And I have n sides. Uh, and the hopping term is the term which takes one electron from one side to the nearest side. So that's what I explained last time. It gives me the kinetic term, which can sometimes be approximated as k squared. And so it gives me the dynamics of my, uh, of my system. It's a non-interacting system. It's just a, you see the Hamiltonian is just a two fermion um, Hamiltonian. It doesn't have any fourth order term, so it's not an interacting one. So it can be solved quite easily if I want to do it, if I want to do it numerically. So what, how do we do it? <coughs> I mean, I'm going to kind of give you the steps. Let's take a basis, which is going to be just the um, creation of operators on all the sides, C1 dagger, C2 dagger, uh, all the way to Cn dagger. So in this basis, I want to write this Hamiltonian as a matrix, because it's easy to diagonalize it and get the eigenstates and the eigenvalues. So what do I, what do, I do? Okay. And I'm going to write this basis like a psi. This is going to be just this vector. Okay. And I'm going to write then my Hamiltonian like that. And now my Hamiltonian is going to be an n by n matrix Okay, in this basis. And I just need to find out its components. So if I take this Hamiltonian, and I'm also going to add a term which is going to be proportional to the density of electrons on each side. So I'm going to add a term which at each side is going to be the given by the chemical potential on the corresponding side. So this is the hopping term, which gives me the kinetic energy, and this is the potential energy. So it's the energy of the electrons on each side. This is the most basic Hamiltonian we can write when we talk about tide mining. Then we can quite easily see what are the elements of this matrix. So this H, which is n by n, 
the first term here. So it's going to be the coefficient of C1 dagger C1. And I said this is going to be mu1. OK? And the same way for all the diagonal terms. So the diagonal terms are going to be the coefficients of the CI dagger CI terms. There would be mu1 and uh, all the way to mu1. And then I see that the t's are coupling the nearest neighbors. So I'm going to have a t which is proportional to C1 dagger C2. So it's going to enter here. It's going to be the second term on the first line. And then I'm going to have zeros because C1, the first operator, is only connected to the second one. So it's only this one is going to be non-zero. C2 is going to be connected to C1. There is going to be an on-site term. And I'm going to have then T23. I'm going to connect the second one from the third one, and so on. And then the other ones are going to be 0. The last one is going to be connected just with the one before. So it's going to be Tn minus 1n. Okay, so you see that I have an n by n matrix, which describes my system. And um, well, if you've worked with computers before, uh, you say, well, oh, I have a matrix. And I can get its eigenvalues and its eigenstates by doing a diagonalization on the computer. I put it in mathematics or whatever program you want. And this, uh, the computer is going to give me the eigenstates and the eigenvalues. And this is what we call solving this Hamiltonian. Okay. Oh, and uh, then if I want, before I go into the procedure of actually how do I solve it and what do I do with what I get from there, I'm going to give you a few more examples of matrices which correspond to tight mining Hamiltonians for different, for, other, for different other systems, because this is the simplest one. Though. Like I told you, this is just an on-site term plus a hopping, which doesn't have any spin, doesn't have any higher order hoppings. But then in physics, I mean, you, this Hamiltonian doesn't, give you, doesn't show much interest, but we have more complicated Hamiltonians, like I, like I told you the previous, uh, in the previous lecture. And for those, it's a bit more uh, interesting to see uh, what the Hamiltonian is going to look like. So we also, besides having just electrons on one side, we can have an internal degrees of freedom on each side. So I'm not going to only have CI, but I'm going to have, for example, spin. So then I have CI. Okay. So on each side, instead of having one operator, I'm going to have two operators on each side. Or I can have sometimes, when I'm working with superconductivity, I have to put both the electron and the whole component of my wave function on a given, on a given side. I cannot just uh, work with the electron part. I also have to separately distinguish the whole part. So I'm going to write on each side. Because in here, I'm assuming that the electron and the hole are fully symmetric. There is absolutely no breaking of symmetry between. But sometimes, if I have a superconducting term, then I really have to consider, for example, coupling between CI and CI. And you see, in this Hamiltonian, I only consider coupling between CI dagger and CI. So if I have superconductivity, then I have to double my basis, and I have to add the CIs in this, uh, on, in this vector and the CI daggers in these vectors also. <coughs> so on each side, I have to write the four components. And if I write it like that, I see that I can, in my ma uh, Hamiltonian matrix, I can also have superconducting terms. I can have terms which couple, for example, CI dagger with CI dagger. In here, I cannot have, because here I only have electrons coupling with holes. In, if I want to have two electrons coupled together, I need to have a basis which is double. This, uh, this is what you will call the bogolubov dijon uh, form of the Hamiltonian. But the idea is that we need to put both the, both the electrons and the holes on, bones, on both sides. OK, so you see that if I have only spin, my Hamiltonian is going to be 2n by 2n, because each element of the Hamiltonian now is going to be a 2 by 2 matrix in the spin space. And if I have this, then my Hamiltonian is going to be 4n by 4n. And Oftentimes, we're going to use this. Because uh, when we care about my runner, we have superconductivity. We also have magnetic field. Oftentimes, so if we want to do the more, most general 
the most general um, Hamiltonian, and we write it 4n by 4n. Um, Well, I can take any uh, any Hamiltonian that I want. So if I have a magnetic field, so that, uh, for example, along the z, then I have a vz term. Okay. So I'm I'm now I'm breaking the symmetry between the up and the down electrons. So that's the uh, a spin along z. So this is like the tight binding Hamiltonian for. A magnetic field which is directed along Z. I can write it, of course, for the X and the Y components, but, well, in general, since you only have one direction, we project it on Z and we work with this because it's more convenient. But you see here, um, by doing it like that, I'm breaking symmetry between the up and the down uh, of uh, components of the Hamiltonian. Always, there is always a Hermitian conjugate in, in, my, uh, in my terms, which assures the particle hole symmetry of the Hamiltonian. Uh, I, I need to have particle hole symmetry in terms of... Uh, Okay, so this is the example. So this is magnetic field. And you see that uh, what this is going to modify is that instead of having mu i term on, one on the side i, mu i is going to be replaced by a 2 by 2 matrix. It's going to have mu i here, mu i here, oh, I have to make it there, minus plus v g i here, and it's going to be minus v. So this, the first term corresponds to up, up. So it's mu plus v. This term corresponds to down, down. So it's mu minus v. And this, is correspond, this corresponds to up, down. So it's 0. And this is down, up. So it's 0. So the diagonal terms of my 2 by 2 matrix, which are now uh, are replacing my mu's in the big matrix, is, are mu plus v and mu minus v. Oftentimes, we take mu to be uniform and v to be uniform, but I'm keeping the coefficients because sometimes I have a mu which depends on the position and the magnetic field which depends on the position. Okay? So this is for a magnetic field. Okay, now the other term which we consider oftentimes is the conductivity. Okay, if I only have S wipe, so simple type of superconductivity, which is described by some local coupling. Okay. So this is the simplest type of superconductivity I can put in a, on a lattice. This is the on-site coupling between an electron between two electrons, so it's pairing between two electrons two electrons on opposite spin on site. This is the simplest type of superconductivity. We call it S-wave. We also ha we can have different types of superconductivity, which I'm not going to maybe um, give you now in, in details, but we also ha we can have P-wave. And this is going to couple <coughs> up, up, with down, down. And oftentimes, this is off diagonal, meaning it's coupling uh, side i with side i plus 1. So it's some sort of a hopping or some sort of pairing between um, electrons on two different sides. You remember the previous, uh, in the previous lecture, the Kitaev model, where I didn't have spin, but I, I had this type of coupling. So this is some sort of a p-wave, spinless p-wave superconductivity in which I'm coupling two electrons, I'm pairing two electrons on uh, uh, nearing sides. And this is like the most basic form of pure superconductivity. It's spinless because in the Kitai model I didn't have spin. In here, um, if I'm taking into account the spin like I do in uh, real systems, then I'm going to have up, up, and down, down uh, type of uh, coupling. But then since I have symmetry in the spin, I have to have anti-symmetry in momentum. You know that uh, superconductivity has to f be an anti-symmetric type of coupling. So if I'm having a symmetry in the spin, I have to have anti-symmetry in the coupling, and then I need to have some sort of a, a momentum which interferes, and then it's going to be uh, nearest neighbor coupling superconductivity. It cannot be on site. So on site, I cannot have terms like this is forbidden by symmetry because I have symmetric pairing in both uh, position and 
in uh, in uh, spin. So in order to have an um, anti-symmetric coupling, I need to have something like. Something like that. This is um, some sort of a P wave superconductor. Okay. So now you see that uh, this uh, type of <coughs> term, in order to take into account this type of term, going to write on site a 4 by 4 Hamiltonian and again diagonally I'm going to get for the electrons I'm going to get like before mu i plus bi, mu i minus bi, but see here you see that I have reverted the order. So this is like a chemical potential for the holes, or is the inverse of the, fir of, the of the of the first term. So then these terms have to come with the minus sign because now I'm starting with the uh, hole and then I have the electron. So this is exactly the opposite of ci up dagger ci up, and now I have ci up ci up dagger. So it's the inverse. So it will come with the minus. Okay. Again, this is C dagger C, and here I have C C dagger. So you know the fermions anti-commute. So the coefficient of this has to be the minus of the coefficient of this term. And then I have zero here, but then I have the delta term here, because my delta term is coupling the C I up dagger with the C down dagger. So it has to come in here, because it's coupling the first term on this line with the fourth term on this line. And then I have zero here, and then I have the delta i here, zero, zero, delta i, zero, delta i, zero. So each of the four term, each of the four um, operators here is going to have a counterpart in the second thing, which comes with the delta, with the coefficient delta. So the deltas are going to come in on this diagonal. Okay. So now, if you look in my f n by n Hamiltonian. If I look in my n by n Hamiltonian, the on-site term, which before was a number, and then it was replaced by a 2 by 2 matrix, now it's going to be replaced by this matrix, which is a 4 by 4 matrix. So my Hamiltonian is going to be 4 by 4. And at least for this Hamiltonian, I haven't changed anything <coughs> to the t's. The t's are going to be 4 by 4, four, by four matrices, but they are going to be just or not identity, but 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1 matrices. But the mu the, these terms are going to be changed. Now, of course, if I had hoping, which is spin dependent, or if I had superconductivity, which is coupling the nearest neighbors, then they will affect this term. And this fo the, the st internal structure of this term is going to be different. So the whole trick about the type binding is to write this Hamiltonian well. You have to think well and write the matrix well. The moment you have written the matrix, everything is moved after that. But the, the trick is to write the matrix at the beginning. So you have to think very carefully about the matrix, and then, and then do it, and then it's simple from there. And for example, one tricky thing, which I <laughs> always have problems writing the, um, the, ham the matrix, is the Rajba term, because uh, there, you remember from the previous lecture, we have, you have spin, spin flip between two nearest neighbor sides, but you have to remember what sign you are using for each, you know, each pair of terms. So I'm not going to do it for you because I, I don't know it, uh, you know, by heart, and I, I, I didn't bother to, to do it carefully. But the structure of this term is like that: it has an i, and then it has a hopping term between uh, an up term on side i and an i plus one terms on side. Uh, on sorry, and an up terms on side i and a down term on side i plus one, and it's going to affect the t, and it's going to hint you have this going you are going to have this i alpha terms which are going to appear in the t term. Okay, the t term is not going to be just the normal hopping, but it's going to be um, so the t is going to look something like that. If you only have up and down, it's going to be t and t, and then you're going to have this type of 
i alpha minus i alpha times i plus one here. You're going to have a diagonal hopping, which is t, which doesn't flip spin, and you're going to have an off-diagonal term, which, fi which flips spin between up and down between nearest sides. So this is, you know, the trickiest part is to be able to write the coefficients of the, uh, of the um, tight binding Hamiltonian correctly, and especially in cases like that, when you have Rajpa, so you have eyes and you have spin, which fits, and things like that, you have to be really, really careful when you do your Hamiltonian, because sometimes you may even get a non-Hermitian matrix. If you're not careful, and then you, are <laughs> you have problems if your matrix is not Hermitian. Okay. Good. So the first step is writing the matrix. The second step is solving it. So the second you don't do it yourself, of course. <coughs> you put in the computer, the computer does it for you. You cannot do it yourself because it's too big. If you have a hundred sites, you have a four hundred by four hundred matrix, you cannot diagonalize yourself, so you put in the computer. And what does the computer give you? Then because then you have to interpret what, what the computer gives you. So you had your Hamilton, let's say four n by four n. And the computer is telling you, look, you have these eigenvalues. The energy is epsilon 1 all the way to epsilon 4n. And you also have psi 1, the eigenstate, the corresponding eigenstate, which are epsilon 1 all the way to epsilon 4n. Uh, sorry, psi 1 uh, all the way to epsilon 4n. So what am I, how am I making sense out of this? For example, how do I compute the density of states of my system if I have this information? So that's the next step that I want to, that I need to do is to use this information to get my physical quantities, that the, the quantities that I'm interested in. And I chose to use this example, the example of 4n, uh, uh, because then I, I have to remember that I have n sites, but I also have an internal structure. And the internal structure is on each side i, I, I need to, I have four coefficients for my wave function. I have the coefficient for the electrons, and I put an electron here, and I have the coefficient of the whole component. So on each side I have four, uh, four coefficients, so electron up, electron down, or up and hold down. Okay. okay, so the first thing to do is to, the first quantity that we're originally interested in when we look, uh, look at tight binding is the density of states. So how do I get the density of states out of this thing? So what is the density of states? You know the, what the density of state is? Is um, the number of, how should I say, is the number of electronic states available if I want to add an electron in my given system, how much room do I have to add an electron? Or how, what's the probability of an, electronic, uh, of an electron to live at a certain energy? It's more or less that. I mean, what's the probability that an electron lives at a given energy. So in order to get it from this, what I'm doing usually, let's intuitively first, I'm plotting the energy spectrum. So the computer gave me the four n eigen, uh, eigenvalues. So I'm, I'm plotting them. Assume, uh, let's assume some sort of a distribution like that. I have some here, and then here I have also many of them. Okay. So this is my spectrum. So this is the energy here. And these are the eigenvalues which are <laughs> given by the, uh, by the diagonalization procedure. So I'm going to remember that the formula for the density of states uh, is a sum of delta function. So each state is giving me like a small peak in the in the density of states, each level is going to give me some sort of a um, some sort of a peak. So let's think about qu quantum dot. Quantum dot has levels, okay? And the density of states for a dot is going to look like that. I'm going to have levels, and density of state is going to be discrete levels. So each of the level is going to give me a peak in the density of state. If I have bands, and the, the bands 
are going to look like that. I have many states which are hidden in this band. Okay? And the density of states is more or less, we see it as uniform, but actually we need to remember that the density of states is like a sum of states. And each level is going to be very close to the other one. And when I sum them all together, I see some sort of a constant uh, density. But actually, I have to remember that each band is made of uh, you know, many, many states, and the states are very close to each other. So because of that, I'm getting some sort of a constant thing. So if I have a result which looks like that, I'm, I'm going to add this sort of a these sort of peaks for each of my states, which are here in the spectrum. And in practice, I cannot do delta functions. Delta functions are very, very tight. What I'm going to do is are going to be Gaussians. And each Gaussian is going to have a width. Okay. And the width of my levels is um, a parameter which I usually put in by hand in the, in the computer. And it's uh, coming from what we call the inverse quasi-particle lifetime. So the, bro um, the width of one level is given to the uh, inverse um, the time that the quasi-particle can live on that level. So usually I have scattering processes from, you know, with uh, leads or whatever with other things. So my quasi-particle cannot live forever on this level, so then it's going to have some finite decay time, and this decay time is going to give me some width to a specific energy level. So each of these delta functions is going to be broadened by some, uh, some energy, which again comes from this um, inverse quasi-particle lifetime. So if I put this here, let me go. Okay. <coughs> and now I'm plotting up the sum of all this. But what I'm going to get, I'm going to have some band here. You see? And then I will have a small peak here, and another here, and another here, and then we'll get something like that. So this is what's going to happen when I'm adding up all these peaks. I'm going to get this, which is a density of state. So that's what I, how I use the results of my Hamiltonian, which is di diagonalized to get uh, physical quantities like the density of state. And then I have other quantities. I'm not going to give you too much because <laughs> you're going to get bored. Then I have the local density of state, which is a density of state, but it's not the average density of state of the system. It's going to be the density of state on a given side. So then I have to do exactly the same thing, but instead of summing on site i, I have to do sorry, on site j, I'm going to sum all the eigens, eigenstates, but when I'm adding these peaks, I have to add some weight, and this weight is the coefficient of uh, the electron up and the electron down um, on the side i. Uh, sorry, I'm on side, I have to add oops, j. Okay. Side j and on, I'm summing over all four n eigenstates from one to four n. So I'm summing all the over all the i's, and then I'm, but I'm focusing only on coefficient on side j. So this is going to be the local density of states. I have to fix j, which is going to be my side. This is the j side. So I'm only looking there. I'm not looking anymore at the average. And then I'm taking all the coefficients of the wave functions which are uh, living on side j. I'm not taking the average over all the sides again. I'm just focusing on the coefficients that are spit out by the uh, diagonalization procedure, which are localized on side j. And this is going to give me the local density of states on side j. Okay, and I'm going to just give you a picture of something. So here you see uh, one example of such things. <coughs> Thank you. So here you see that I'm plotting the local density uh, state. I, I'm doing it on uh, here because I can do it in colors, because uh, on the blackboard I can only do black and white. So now in color is the density of state. This is the color coded thing. I have two axes. I have the energy and I have the position. And so the third axis is the local density of state, which is color coded here. Here, here, it's the, um, I'm, I'm just going to that in a second. So here's the local density of state. You see that I have here some local density of state. This is for a Majorana chain. At zero energy, I have high intensity for the local density of state on the two ends because I have the Majorana state forming. Okay, so the, the density of state has these peaks at zero energy on the two end sides. But in the bulk, I have a gap 
I have no state in between, uh, inside the gap, and I have some bands. So I have a lot of states which are contributing to these bands here. Okay, so this comes from a formula like that. I'm summing all the eigenstates which I, I can find, and then I'm looking at each side separately. So on a given side, I'm, side, I'm, I'm summing up all the, all the spectrum. I get peaks here and here. And at zero energy, I see that I have peaks on the ends of my system. So uh, this is just the local density of states in the electronic local density of states, but we can also look at quantities like the spin polarization, which is the same thing, but instead of calculating the sum of the up and the down electron on one side, I'm doing the difference. So if I'm making the difference between the up and the, do uh, the down electron, then it's I'm, I'm calculating the local spin on a given side. I sum over all the spectrum, and I see that I get the polarization of my, uh, the spin polarization as a function of energy and the position. So here, you see that for the Majorana chain, I have two, the two Majorana states are actually polarized along the z-direction. They, bo they both have the same polarization along the z-direction. But the and the two bands, the lower energy and the uh, the positive energy and the negative energy are oppositely polarizing spin. So this is coming also from a numerical diagonalization of the tight binding Hamiltonian. You see the spin, and you see that you can get information about the spin along x, along z, uh, y, whatever. You can get everything, basically, because you have all the coefficients of the electron hole um, uh, spin up and spin down on, on each side. Okay. So that's more or less it about one chain, but then there is one uh, also, a bit more interesting uh, procedure, which sometimes we have to do when we don't have chains, when we have ribbons. Because ribbons, okay. so assuming I have now a system which is finite in one direction and infinite in the second direction. If I were to do a system which is finite in both directions, then it's simple, because uh, this has a finite number of, like, uh, of atoms. So it's just n1 times n2. So no problem. I'm just doing a Hamilton, which is bigger. It's h for n1 times uh, n2, because I have more sides. So it's exactly as the chain. I, I can <coughs> write out the Hamiltonian for a finite size system, like a big matrix. I can write out all the hopping terms be between electrons on this direction and on the other direction. It's going to be a mess, because you have to keep up uh, tracking all the hopping terms in your system. So this atom is connected to this atom and then it's connected to this atom, but what is the number of this atom? So you have to remember where in the matrix you, you fill in all your matrix if you have a finite size, you know, n1 by n2. If you have hexagonal lattice, then it's even a bigger mess because you have to remember uh, that one atom on this side is connected to three atoms uh, in, the, in space, and then uh, what are the indices of those three atoms, and how do you write the hopping term? It's really going to be a mess if you have hexagonal or, or a different type of symmetry for your lattice. So I'm not going to get into that. There are people who are really good at that. <laughs> um, you know, I'm just giving you the principle. So when you have a fully finite size system, at least it's not so uh, you know, straightforward. You know what I have to do, even if it's not simple. It's straightforward, but not simple. But if I have a system which is infinite in one direction and finite in the second direction, what do I, what do, I do then? I mean, it's uh, because, you know, then things may be a bit more complicated because I cannot put in my Hamiltonian an infinite number of atoms because this in this direction my system is infinite. So I cannot put in the computer a matrix of an infinite direction. So what do I do in that case? I, I use a trick, and this trick is quite useful and took me a long time. Even if it's simple, it took me a long time before I figured it out. So I have a ribbon. And this uh, y is infinite, and the x is finite. And I go between sides y I one to n on the x direction, and y is infinite. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a partial Fourier transform of my Hamiltonian. I'm going to replace the creation, the uh, annihilation operators on side x and y by a partial. I'm going to do a Fourier transform only in the y direction. The y direction being infinite, this ky is going to be a good quantum number. So intuitively, you're going to know that the wave function 
uh, corresponding to the y direction, I'm going to have a phase factor, which is a, pla a plane wave phase factor, just e to the i k y, because uh, I have propagation in this direction. I have just three propagations, so I just have three plane waves. So I'm going to do a uh, partial Fourier transform in the y direction. And I'm going to write my uh, hopping Hamiltonian in this now in these types in these types of operators. <coughs> so assuming I have T So in 2D, the, uh, the hopping Hamiltonian contains terms with tunnel between x and x plus 1, but keep y fixed. And I have terms with tunnel between y and y plus 1, and keep x fixed. So I have the two types of terms, and they are going to act differently. So I'm putting in the Fourier transforms. And the other term, <coughs> this term has these two terms, uh, just ky and ky prime, because um, I have the same y. And here, because I have different y's, I'm going to next. I'm going to get an extra i to k i k y i. Because I here I had an y and here I had an I plus y plus one. So when I do the Fourier transform in this uh, in this space, then I'm going to get an extra factor here because k y prime comes in with a um, y plus one. Of course, when I do the sum, then I can I get a delta function in k y um, in k y. So I get k y k y plus um, equal k y prime. When I do the sum over, um, I do sum over y, and I'm left with the sum over x. The second term has this term. From this term, which was coming from y, hoping from y to y plus 1. And you can see that now I can look at my Hamiltonian as a sum of Hamiltonians of, uh, inde uh, of index ky. So my Hamiltonian is going to be now a sum of Hamiltonians, so I can separate the ky's. So at each ky, I have a different Hamiltonian, and that these Hamiltonians are fully independent. So I can work on each of them separately. So I'm going to work now on each h ky, and this is going to be like ky is becoming like a parameter. So ky is like a parameter of my system now. Okay. So you see that now I have a hopping Hamiltonian in x, which has a sort of a parameter thing which depends on, on y. So now it's quite simple because now I can do the diagonalization of my Hamiltonian at, uh, at uh, parameter y the same way I was doing it before because this whole thing doesn't depend at all on x in any way. So at, k, at, the, value of, uh, at the given value of ky, I'm doing my numerical diagonalization the way I was doing it before. But I remember that I have an energy now for everything which is multiplied by ky. So it's like the procedure is repeating itself with, again, the modification that I have this ky dependence of each of the Hamiltonian, of each ky Hamiltonian. But I decoupled my system into a big number um, of Hamiltonians, which are now parameterized by ky. So when I do it, uh, when I do it, I get what I call the band structure, meaning at each ky, I'm doing, I'm just plotting the corresponding spectrum. So imagine I cut, I, I'm looking at ky here as py equals zero. Then you see that I have a state here, and then I have many states here. I'm looking at the different py. I have a state here, and I have state here, and the same 
for all the values at py. This corresponds not to this Hamiltonian, of course, but to a more complicated Hamiltonian, which had delta and which had um, um, Majorana coupling it. So this is for a Majorana, this is for a Majorana ribbon. So this example which I gave you here is the simplest one, just a normal um, hopping Hamiltonian. If I were to get distance structure, of course I need to put uh, the terms which is are corresponding to the Kitaev model, so the um, uh, hopping terms uh, in delta and, and all that. But this, the idea is the same, that I'm decoupling, uh, you know, my system into many values of ky, and for each ky I'm solving, you know, a 1D diagonalization procedure, and then I put everything together and I, bet I get the band structure. So that's the procedure to, uh, when you have an infinite drip, and that's how you, people usually do tight mining uh, to get the spectrum. Yes, sorry, have a question? Yeah, that's the, that's the, um, it's a bit more tricky than just, like I said, just getting the simple one chain and diagonalizing it. So it's not too complicated, but you have to be a bit careful. Especially imagine here, I put the same T in the X and the Y direction, but imagine that my T coming with this term was different. So then I'd have a term which is coming in here, or I could have other things and then. This you had this type of coupling. <laughs> so okay, let's put it on. So it had this type of hopping, it had a mu and it had a t, and then you have to just have to uh, satisfy some condition that the mu and t uh, are related by some, uh, by some simple thing. Not everything so is possible. Yes. You, you need this condition. Yeah, you have to impose that the hopping is between minus 2 mu and 2 mu. But if uh, these two, um, you know, for a Hamiltonian like that with this constraint, it gives you the Majorana. So in a sense, it's property of any superconductor. Uh, it has to be P wave because I, uh, it's, you see, this is like spinless. Mm -hmm. So being spinless, it's, uh, if you are to go in the spin state, it's like coupling up with up. So this corresponds to a P wave superconductor. It, it doesn't work for S wave. S wave, which has on site hopping, if I had to do X, X here, then it wouldn't give me that. So I need some sort of P wave type of coupling, which is coupling uh, an electron on one side with an electron on the neighboring side. So this is like um, anti-symmetric, so it's a P wave type of coupling. So if you had that, so you have, you have a coupling between neighboring sides, and you had this condition, yes, then you have uh, Majorana. You have <coughs> the zero energy state. Yeah. So it, it has to satisfy some condition. It's not fully generic. Okay. So any more questions? Because I'm going to chi change gears now because this was more all the all about the tight binding that I wanted to say. So this is so this is the first technique that people use to get Majorana. It's the most common. I mean, whenever you talk to somebody and they want to tell they get Majorana, this is 90% of the case. That's what people do. I mean, to get Majorana state, to get topological state, they diagonalize, they get the edge state. So that's uh, they get the band structure like that. So that's how you that's how you get uh, Majorana in uh, most of the time. So now I'm going to give you some alternatives to that because this is numerical. So assuming I'm theory is never that I did uh, use computers in my life or used it very little. I don't know how to put a hexagonal lattice on <laughs> on a computer. So what do I do then? I may I need to have some other options. I mean I cannot only do uh, numerics. I can also, I need to do some other things. Of course, numerics are very good because they are very general. You can do a lot of things with numbers. It doesn't, uh, doesn't work all the time. So the other, uh, the, f the next type of um, procedure that we do, uh, which is not so general, and in order to work, you need to most of the time to do a lot of approximation, is to, do, is to solve the Schrodinger equation. So Schrodinger equation, in order to be able to solve it, it has to be quadratic. It has to, you need to have some sort of like, uh, you know, second order um, 
kinetic, uh, kinetic energy, or more actually, not even that. In order to really <laughs> solve it, you have to, uh, for this type of problem, you need to have linear terms in your, uh, in your dispersion. If you have more than linear, it's a bit more complicated. So you remember that I told you in the previous lecture about the Kitai model. So the Kitai model was looking like that. And it was not, if you remember, it was not at all linear. The Kitai model had mu t and delta. And it, if you remember the band structure for the Kitai model, let's take like that. But for a diff different values of mu, it had some more complicated band structure. So this was for mu equal minus 2t is this, uh, is this type of uh, band structure for different values of mu, it had different band structure. So you see that this one is very hard to get anything linear about it. But if you look at mu equals minus 2t, at a particular case of mu, you had this point at k equals 0, and this is energy by some momentum, and this is k equals 0. You said you have a point here where you can linearize the spectrum. Well, you can linearize it here too, but it's, well, not so, not, so, not so nice. So the nicest thing is, OK, look at mu equals minus 2t. And I see that close to this point, the band structure is linear. So I can linearize around this point, And now I can rewrite um, this Hamiltonian in a linear form. So what I'm going to do <coughs> when I take mu equals minus 2t, and I'm looking around k equals 0, I'm doing some sort of low, what we call the low energy expansion. Uh, because you see also that this is a 0 of energy. So I'm looking here, and this is low energy. So here is equals 0, so I'm, I'm looking at the point which is close to 0 energy. So I'm linearizing, I'm doing a low energy expansion. And I'm going to write now, I'm not going to give you the details, but <coughs> you can believe me. The <laughs> Hamilton is going to look like that. This is going to be constant, because this, has a, this is constant, and this is a cosine term. And if there's a cosine term, the cosine close to 0 is 1. So this is going to have terms, quadratic terms. I'm going to ignore the quadratic terms um, in k. So these two terms are just going to give me a constant, um, a constant um, term. And this term, which has a sign, if you remember, from the band structure before, is going to be the sign when I wrote the, ben, uh, when I wrote the uh, Hamiltonian momentum space the, the previous lecture. So the cosine is going to be given 1 minus k squared, but since k is close to 0, I'm going to ignore the k squared contribution. And this is going to be a sign, so I'm going to keep the linear term in the sign. So it's going to come in here. Yes. <laughs> so it's uh, c, k. c minus k basis. So it's going to be this, h, and then going to be Minus k. So that's the basis. Yeah. Again, uh, these are going to be the ck, ck type <coughs> of terms, and these are going to be just ck dagger, ck, and ck, ck um, dagger term. So if I manage to have a linear form of Hamiltonian in momentum space, so now I can go back to the real space to write some sort of a Schrodinger equation for my problem. So I'm going to back to real space to write the Hamiltonian in real space. And I'm going to get h is equal. I'm going to write it like that. And this m is going to be just minus 2t minus mu. That's going to be that. To write it a bit simpler, and this is going to be v. I'm going to call it V, and it's going to be, sorry, uh, right. OK, minus 1. OK, 
It's still in momentum space. And this time, when I go to real space, it's going to become minus v i dx i i minus i zero. So k is going to give me a dx. So k is i dx, actually. So the derivative from the real space. In, in the real space, k is going to go to i d, uh, dx. The 2 delta is the, I'm going to call it v. So this is the form of my uh, of my Hamiltonian now in um, in uh, in real space, and because we like Pauli, Pauli matrices, then I'm going to write this as m times sigma z minus v times i dx sigma y. Okay, sigma y is zero i minus i zero, and then sigma z is uh, one minus one. So I'm going to write it in uh, Pauli matrix form to make it a bit more compact, and so, in order to solve it, I, I'm applying it uh, on the Moy function, and I say h psi equals 0. Actually, I have to write h psi equals e psi. But what, I, what I'm saying is I want to look for a Majorana solution. So if I want to look for a Majorana solution, I know the Majorana has to uh, have a 0 energy. So in order to find the Majorana solution, I need to solve h psi equals 0, because the e of the Majorana is 0. So I have to solve the Schrodinger equation, which corresponds to the fact that a psi equals to 0. It's a bit peculiar equation. It's not as uh, simple as h, h psi equals e psi with some given particular value of e. If e equals 0, then this equation times psi has to be 0. OK? Um, I can make some answers, like we usually do when we solve the Schrodinger equation. I see that this is a linear equation, so I can make some I can make some answers about it to solve it. It's not, of course, it's quite simple, but I'm just uh, there are some peculiar peculiarities because again, energy of the Majorana is zero, so it's just a little bit peculiar. So I'm going to first multiply by before I do that, I, I'll multiply by sigma y everything to make it even a bit simpler. I'm going to get i m sigma x psi minus i v i two g x psi zero. I'm dropping the i's from here, and I assume that psi is z times x. Be a good thing when a is alpha times beta. So this is going to be the uh, this is going to be my solution, and then plug it in back in uh, in my equation, and I'm going to get zero. So. Let's look it in. Uh, let's write it now back in a matrix form. So I'm going to have v g m Okay. Remember, a is a two by two uh, is a two side vector. So in order that this uh, works, I need that the Hamiltonian of this matrix has to be zero. So in order to have solution for this problem, I have uh, I need the Hamiltonian of this matrix to be zero. So from there, I get. Well, my name is easy. From where I get that m squared minus b squared, b squared is zero. And take off this part. So then I get that z is plus or minus m over b. Okay. So I got the coefficient for my decay y function. So this exponential, um, the, the answer which I choose is an exponentially decaying uh, y function with this coefficient, m over v. m, again, was uh, two, two minus 2t minus mu, and uh, z was, uh, an, um, sorry, v was 2 delta. And if I'm interested, for example, on solution on leave at positive, um, at positive x, then I need to have a decaying function. So z has to be. Negative. 
Okay. In order that my solution decays at x going to infinity, otherwise it diverge, and we don't want that. So we have different type of solutions on the right side of x and the left side of x. So for x bigger than zero, we need z bigger than zero, and for x smaller than zero, we need z bigger than zero. So we need uh, this constraint. And looking at these values for m over v, then z has to be, since there are 2t minus mu, m was already negative, so we have to take z equals minus m over v for x zero. Okay, so this is the solution. So now I have to go back to calculate A because uh, I also need to know um, the internal structure of the wave function, not only the decay, but not only the decay. So if I go back here, I, I see that minus Vz has to be equal to M. So I get minus M, 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 minus M applied on alpha beta next to this zero. And you see that in order for this equation to be satisfied, I need alpha equal beta. beta. I mean, otherwise, it, it doesn't go to zero. Okay. And there is an, the third condition which I need to satisfy. So I know that what z is. I know that alpha equals beta, and I need a normalization constant. The third, the third condition. So the integral, normal, the, so the normalization is the integral of psi squared between uh, zero to infinity. The normalization has to be equal to one. So then I'm, I'm looking, I'm seeing that normalization is two times alpha squared. And then e to the for m over v, two m over v times x integrated between zero to infinity has to be equal to one. And this is giving me that alpha If you do the integral and get the uh, and get the numbers out, you have to you see that you're going to get that alpha is square root of m over v in order to have this normalization constant to uh, to be satisfied. So that's the um, that's the the three conditions. So uh, the function goes to zero at infinity. Uh, the determinant has to be zero. Uh, and then the equation this equation is giving me alpha equal beta. So from from and, and the normalization has to be equal one. So from these conditions, I get uh, the solution. So this is the wave function corresponding to this model solved at close to zero energy by linearization of the spectrum. So this is um, the type of wave function which I get. And you see, I mean, if you look carefully at this solution, you see this is a Majorana. You remember what I told you the previous time. A Majorana has the electron hole and the hole part to be the same. Because if I take psi dagger, then the electron goes into the hole. So then this is a Majorana, because the electron part and the hole part are the same. So this internal structure of my wave function is telling me that the solution of this Hamiltonian close to zero energy is a Majorana, actually. So I assume it's a Majorana at zero energy, and then I actually find when I do all my calculations that it does look like a Majorana. It has the electron and the whole component to be equal. So that's the um, that's another technique to get uh, solutions for the this type of Majorana Hamiltonian. However, I don't know if you mm, can uh, figure it out. It's not such a simple way to get it because you did many approximations with linearization, so you have to be at zero energy, so you have to have some already some information that there is a Majorana, you assume that there is a zero energy solution. And this is a very simple system. If I were to do some uh, system with domain ones, for example, where M is changing, then I had to do very complicated matching of the Schrodinger equation. I had different uh, Z's on both on the on the two sides, or I have um, you know I have a parameter changing from position to position. So it's it's not something which is very general. It can work in simple cases. I can do it, and it can work in some simple cases, but it's a technique which it's not. I cannot apply it for all the models. If I'm going to 2D, I already get a mess. So it, it's it's really not. It, it's a good thing that we have this technique, but for my runner models in general, it's very complicated. So it doesn't work all the time. So I, I mean, I'm giving it to you because it's nice. It shows, in, you know, uh, in a nice way that we have our solutions. But it's not, it's not general. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's nice, but it doesn't work for very complicated situations. It works for simple, um, for simple situations most of the time. 
So maybe, I don't know, I think maybe it's a good time to stop now and I, have, uh, I can start into something else uh, after, after the break. Okay, so maybe a pressing question? Uh, otherwise, we continue. Yes. Mm -hmm. 